All right, good morning. Cool. Uh, so today we're going to be talking about conscious design and about the joys of backwards compatibility. So this is the big leap of Python 3.13. My name is Wukash. I come from the internet. There's uh, all sorts of ways to contact me online. But for the next two days, I'm actually going to be here um, in person. So if you want to talk to me about any of the topics that um, I'm familiar with, I'm very happy to talk to you. Um, so what would the topics be? So well, I started using Python in 2004 and became a, a core developer in 2010. Um, by 2013, I uh, started working at Facebook where I was uh, for five years in California. And during this time, I worked with Guido on PEP484, that's typing, and organized the first and second annual core sprints for the core developers, first at Instagram, the second at um, of the greater Facebook. Uh, so during this time, I did like a bunch of work on async IO and typing. So those are the topics that are uh, like very dear uh, to my heart. Right? And um, these days, I work directly for the Python Software Foundation. Um, on CPython as the CPython developer in residence. So what that means is I support the developer team to make sure to unblock them where stuff doesn't work just as they expect in terms of automation and CI and so on and so on. I do review pull requests uh, on the repository and work on some of the changes of my own, but like that is less of a focus for me since uh, I can review more stuff and unblock more people than I can actually produce of my own changes. So yeah, uh, that's uh, sort of uh, what what I'm doing most of the time and what uh, takes up my day. Uh, I do this remotely, right? So I uh, really need some sort of connection with people to actually see them online uh, is not the same as to see them in person. So I came all the way here. It's over 8,000 kilometers, and this is not only my first time in Thailand, but also my first time in Asia. So I'm enjoying it a lot. Uh, where I come from, it was freezing temperatures, so this is... Uh, um, pretty much like uh, the total opposite, so I, uh, I'm very happy uh, to be here. Uh, so part of the things that I do as part of my job is uh, to be the release manager. So um, there are a bunch of us in the release team. Uh, in particular, I was the release manager of Python 3.8 and 3.9, but I'm still involved. And what that means is I'm cutting releases. Cutting releases means to make sure that some particular commit in our repository gets tagged as the next version of Python 3.9 or 3.10 or 3.11 or whatever. Um, and then from that tag, we produce both the source package as well as the binary packages for Windows and for Mac OS. There is also a third party helper, Anthony, uh, who helps us uh, bring those new releases to Ubuntu uh, in a public package ar um, archive, I guess, which uh, is called Dead Snakes. And I'm helping with that uh, starting like, you know, kind of a week back. So, you know, kind of a new thing. Um, but, you know, um, Dead Snakes was created originally to to uh, provide old and supported versions of Python to new Ubuntu systems. These days, it's the opposite, really. It's uh, uh, a way for you to get a new version of Python on Ubuntu, uh, where uh, Ubuntu doesn't provide that new version yet. So uh, cutting releases. Now we can expect Python to be available kind of like clockwork every year, right? So every October, you can expect that there is going to be a new version of Python. This year, it was 3.12, and next October, it's going to be Python 3.13. But this wasn't always the case, that we released Python uh, on a predictable calendar. In fact, uh, like until very recently, uh, we would say that we're releasing Python every maybe 18 months, but in practice, it was sometimes closer to two years. Like it was, it was not really uh, very predictable. So in 2019, I uh, proposed to change this, to make this more predictable. And the reason why was that uh, we had complaints not only from users, but also from downstream distributors. So from, for example, the maintainers of Linux, like Canonical for Ubuntu and Red Hat for Fedora, that they couldn't rely on us to provide a new version of Python in time for them to include it in the next version of their respective Linux distributions. So now with this change, 
change that I proposed and got accepted in 2019, starting with Python 3.9. Uh, this is fixed, and that brings newer versions of Python uh, to more people quicker, right? But um, um, some people were excited, obviously, about this new uh, world, but some were not. Some were saying, like, what that means now is going to be more change faster, so you're going to be introducing more incompatibilities quicker, and there's going to be more new features that we're going to have to learn, like, you know, kind of, essentially, this is going to accelerate everything. But my mm, thought about this, and the way I explained this, was that this is still the same salami. This is still the same sausage, only sliced thinner, right? So we are still the same team working on the same features. If anything, we are now releasing a little slower because the beta phase and the release candidate phases are both respectively longer, so take up more time than they used to before this change. Um, but obviously, you do see more change these days, but this is not because of the change in the release pace, but because of the growth in both investment and the size of the team working on Python. But what the thin slicing of the releases meant was that increasingly larger features in Python couldn't be made in a single version. If you have a very significant transformation of what a particular um, piece of Python uh, will look like, there is not enough time in a single release to prepare the change, develop it, test it, and make it uh, you know, available to release. So now, increasingly, we have features that are long-going um, kind of improvements, only unlocked every few, few releases. And this time around, we um, gathered a bunch of them, and some of the most anticipated ones, uh, like in a single release in Python 3.13. But in truth, it was always the case that some of the features took more time than every new version of Python could allow. So. Um, even in the late 1990s, we had this running joke that Guido has a time machine. And the joke in the mailing list about this was um, because very often when people wanted a new feature out of Python, they would discover that what they want is already somehow possible, only maybe not very obviously, but if you uh, learn about how Python works, you can achieve what you wanted without um, changes uh, needed to Python because uh, somehow Guido designed uh, like the, the interpreter and the language wisely enough to anticipate your change. So um, this was a long running joke uh, already in 2001 when Tim Peters said, oh, I see Guido used his time machine to ensure that his coding uh, guide has never recommended mixing tabs and spaces. But this running joke was about all sorts of things, about how the sum built-in uh, could be used for more things than just numbers, and uh, how like um, the dunder doc, uh, doc strings are readable, uh, you know, kind of in, um, at runtime, so you can do stuff with them, and so on and so on. So there were plenty of uh, uh, things that I found in the archives of our mailing list about how uh, Guido had a time machine. So um, some of those things obviously are very hard to predict, and they are steered by the so-called killer apps. So how is Python used by everybody? And these days, this would be machine learning. This would be data science, right? But back in the day, this was actually the web. So at first, the first killer app of Python was called Zope. And Zope, the Z object publishing environment, was one of the first content management systems that we had, not only for Python, but in the entire industry. And the magic way it worked was that you created objects that then were published online. And those objects could be some sort of static content that then was generated with an XML template so that you could see it on the web. But in fact, you could put 
Python code there as well. And with every request, Python would execute your code and do something dynamically. So now it's sort of insane to develop code like as part of a CMS. We don't do this anymore. Uh, but at the time, this felt magical, that you have this hyper dynamism that is available, that is possible for you uh, to shape how your website looks like from the website. This was late 1990s, so uh, people were still used to you know, creating static web pages with front page express on their Windows machines and, wh and whatnot. And here we had this fully fledged uh, environment for dynamic processing. But this required essentially your own web server, so your own machine that was connected somewhere to the internet with a public address. So most people who started smaller websites couldn't really do this, right? Couldn't really afford to have uh, this sort of uh, environment for their tiny blog. What they did instead is they used the Apache web server with mod PHP, right, which allowed you to share the same server across very many people. So you could have hundreds of websites if they didn't get much traffic in the same machine. Um, and um, mod PHP worked in this uh, great way where if it just found the file, the index PHP or whatever it was called in the right spot on the disk drive, uh, it could serve you uh, um, PHP. So people wanted the same for Python, but they quickly discovered that this is not possible to have, and the reason why was uh, the Python process, when it starts and it initializes all modules that it loads when your program is starting and then it initializes all globals, this is all global state that cannot really be, uh, you know, like isolated from any other user. So if you had more than one website, well, this would cause issues. So people thought, what if we could split the interpreter into sub-interpreters? So essentially, to have isolated environments in such a way where they can live inside the same process but serve different applications. So this was allowed. This was um, essentially made possible with some caveats, but even with those caveats, there was mod Python created for Apache, and for a while, this was a popular way, pre-WSGI, pre-ASGI, pre pre-Django, like ancient times, to serve tiny Python applications. In fact, like this is how I started uh, serving Python online when I was uh, working on tiny blogs for myself, and so on, and so on. So what really are sub-interpreters? The sub-interpreters that we are talking about today and we talked about then essentially allowed you to initialize an entire separate um, global state for your modules and your globals and so on and so on. Uh, but they still had this limitation that they all shared one global interpreter lock, meaning that within one process, you could only run Python code for one of them at a time. So before we get too far with this, uh, let me just uh, answer a more fundamental question, which is, OK, what's a sub-interpreter? But what is even an interpreter? What, did, what does it mean that Python is an interpreted language? So to see this, you can import uh, the disassembler in Python, so DIS and see what Python is doing for, say, a very simple function. There's a function that takes an argument and does x plus y. So what Python will do is it's going to compile this function into operations. And those operations are symbolized by codes that we call opcodes. And there are uh, just four of them here. And what they do is they're going to load fast the argument x. They're going to load a global, because as you can see, we use y in our function. But y is not a local in our function. So it's going to have to load it globally from some outer scope. A scope. Then having all those two things um, available on our uh, value stack, we can uh, use the binary add operation to sum those together. And then whatever value is put now on the stack, we return. So that is a very simple uh, function that just does one operation. But where it gets interesting is when we have some control flow. So for example, if you have 
a loop, in which case here we have just this list comprehension, stuff gets more interesting. So you have see more opcodes here that, you know, this entire function is going to build a list. Uh, we're going to load fast the argument container and start iterations. So um, we're using this for iteration, uh, which is symbolized by the two uh, chevrons here uh, in uh, opcode 7. And there's the entire single pass of the loop uh, up until uh, opcode 31. So what you have here is essentially we're going to be um, storing x out of the container, loading that value so that we can now uh, use it as an argument to a function that we load from somewhere globally, and that function str, where we know it's a built-in function. We're going to call it with that argument. So after we do it, we add the result to the list that we're building, and so on and so on. The interesting bit here is the control flow that we are only doing this um, str x call if x is truthy, right? So which is why in opcode 16, we have this pop jump uh, to 7 if um, the argument that we just loaded in 13 was false. So you can see how your code, which is just one line, is tra transformed into very many kind of, um, well, not atomic, but small operations that the interpreter is executing one by one. And how does this look like? You can literally open the source code of Python and find this big for loop in C eval.c that is doing exactly that. It is reading opcodes one by one and executing them. So this for loop does all that the interpreter is doing. And the reason why we call it an interpreter is that it is taking the opcode from you know, the compilation of your source code and interpreting what should happen next, one opcode by one. So the reason we um, kind of um, have to make all the optimizations and everything that uh, we are talking about here is, uh, you know, taking a long time is that this is essentially um, programming language that is built on top of the already stateful machine that is a CPU. Uh, so the machine code that we're executing is like one level deeper below this big switch statement that we have here that just chooses which opcode to execute and does a thing per, uh, per opcode, which is why sometimes people will say that Python is a virtual machine, because it's like a virtual processor that doesn't uh, run your CPU instruction directly, what interprets your opcodes, and the programs work like this, which is kind of amazing because now you can modify the code that consists of opcodes in real time, and you can see how it works, you can inspect it very easily from within your program. So this kind of dynamism is allowed by this thing being a virtual machine, essentially. Right, so seeing uh, how Python is an interpreter now, we can go back and talk a little bit about, oh, that's the load fast here, uh, about sub-interpreters again, right? So Python has been conceived as a glue language when Guido first designed it. So his uh, kind of uh, vision for it initially was that this would be something that connects big systems written in C uh, in this sort of orchestration glue language. So the C API, so the way for you to interact with C programs was there from the start. The thing about the C API, though, was that it didn't initially have a very clear distinction between how Python's implementation, which is also in C, uses certain blocks, building blocks of Python, and how external users of Python who create C extensions and write uh, other applications that interact with the C language, what are those parts that they should be using? So essentially, it was a free for all. If this was available for the Python implementation, for uh, the internals of CPython, you could use it as well. So these days, um, 
you know, kind of uh, this is recognized as an issue, and it took a long while for the situation to be cleared up. And only this clearing up of this entire situation through creation of the stable ABI, so the application binary interface, and a version of it that is limited so that you don't have to recompile your C extensions with when a new version comes, and the creation of binary wheels, so a format on PyPI where you can very clearly tell that this was compiled for this version of Python on this particular platform. And in particular, the many Linux platform, which essentially meant whatever Linux distribution you're using, this should work, uh, you know, granted that the glibc version is compatible with you, and so on and so on. So those all improvements were necessary for us to evolve into a world where the sub-interpreters could now have their separate global interpreter locks. So they could run in parallel within the same program on par uh, separate threads. And this is increasingly wanted because from the pre-fork model of Apache, in the 1990s and early 2000s, we evolved into a world that is more asynchronous and uses threads more often or even a single thread that is using uh, some sort of cooperative multitasking to achieve its goal with fewer resources. So uh, this effort to um, make sub-interpreters better, to make sub-interpreters um, not share a global interpreter lock between them, but to have uh, their own, uh, has been uh, spearheaded by Eric Snow and took a long while to complete. And we are there right now. So this is why this took such a long while. But we're talking about the global interpreter lock. So, um, you know, let's focus on what essentially that is and why, you know, that is uh, kind of um, complicated. So what the global interpreter lock and why we want to make Make it optional now in CPython is, is essentially a golden ball and chain of Python. And the reason why is that it is something that was created initially in Python to make it simpler in terms of implementation and also to make it maybe counterintuitively faster. The reason why is this. Mm, if you have the interpreter that we saw before, so with all the opcodes that do things like building lists, if you have another thread of execution that is going to look at your list, what it should be seeing is a list that has two elements or a list that has three elements. But it should never see a list that has an element being added to it, but we're not done with that yet. So the operations should always be atomic, so provide a consistent state. If you had a situation where your length of a list is reporting three, but in fact only two elements are in memory, you could lead to crashes of the entire interpreter. So that would be pretty terrible. So we have to have locking. And obviously we could have locking in the form of a separate lock for every particular um, oper well, data structure. So every list could have their own lock. But this is very uh, costly, right? If you have this sort of operation uh, of you know when you lock every list when there's an element added or removed to it, and there's a lot of them, um, this could lead to slowdowns, and this could lead to deadlocks if you have two locks and one uh, resource uh, locks one lock uh, while asking for something else that requires another lock, but there is another thread that holds that other lock. You could have a situation where they will never agree uh, on the correct uh, order of execution. So, you know, kind of it would be very hard to complete this operation. It would essentially be something that would appear as the application freezing forever. So the solution to this was to have a global lock, so just one lock inside the entire interpreter that would be shared for all operations. And that was awesome for simplicity, and that was essentially pretty quick too, because you only could uh, and had to lock once. So that was pretty cool. But later on, we started seeing more cores in uh, your computers and now even phones and so on and so on. So people wanted to be able to execute their applications on uh, all the resources that they have in their hardware. And a global lock meant that if you locked your interpreter, that lock was spanning across threads, so you couldn't do anything else. This was a little annoying, so obviously there were ideas to remove the gill, and they, those ideas spanned, like you know, even very, very uh, 
you know, kind of old history. So the first attempts were literally in the 90s, uh, and they were all essentially stopped because all those operations that you do here, if you replace uh, the one nice lock with fine-grained locking, start being slower. So we couldn't really get this to work very nicely, and we needed to, um, we needed to try something else. So the way we uh, attempted re removals of the gill, I think the, the best uh, way to do this was uh, in 2015 when Larry uh, Hastings attempted gillectomy on Python 3.5. And he essentially did this so that you could have a Python that didn't have a global log but had fine-grained locking. But what you actually saw was um, that this worked not only slower than the regular Python version on a single thread, but didn't even scale, meaning the more threads you added, the slower it got. And Larry identified the problem with this was essentially uh, like reference counting. So the way Python automatically, uh, automatically tracks memory for you. So because of the automatically tracked memory um, being essentially very eager in Python, this slowdown um, killed the idea. So it wasn't until uh, in 3.9 that Sam Gross came and created PEP 703 uh, to um, remove the gill in a way that is performant. But obviously it wasn't just the removal of the gill that made those things performant. It was a large amount of change, which is why uh, PEP 703 is one of the longest PEPs that we have in the entire array of the documents. Um, because it says, okay, we're removing the gill, but also we're doing all those other changes that allow this not to work slower than before. So some of those uh, things that are done uh, are, you know, um, biased ref counts, so something that makes re reference counting happen less often than before. Uh, Mimaloc, so something that allows us to um, have a thread safe allocator for memory. Uh, container thread safety had to be introduced and this is something that we're still working on and avoiding locking altogether for a lot of the things that we're doing. So uh, all of this leads to the interpreter being more sophisticated these days. So the, th uh, the mm, switch that you saw before was a little trick from mm, my, on my part because this is Python 2.6. Like these days, you don't really have this nice switch anymore. If you look at the code today for Python 3.12, you're, you're gonna see some meta code that is uh, you know, kind of important magically somehow. So how does that work? Well, with PEP 6.59, we got a specialized interpreter. What that means is um, we have an interpreter that is now, um, using runtime profiling to uh, change opcodes from one version to a more specialized version based on types. And even the switch here isn't uh, you know, statically put there in the source code, it is generated by a DSL that is now uh, being made available to the core developers of Python so they don't have to worry about ref counting everywhere here and whatnot, they can focus on the interpreter itself. And what that allows us to actually get, and this got multiple versions of Python until we could get there was to um, make this interpreter better and better to lead to the JET. So to cut through all this indirection that we had before with this uh, switch statement and with all the opcodes to actually translate the opcodes into machine code. So to make them execute faster. And obviously the JIT was something that uh, we wanted to have for a super long time as well. And the reason why was uh, we saw this work for Java with Hotspot and the early 2000s and later even for Python with PyPy. Um, but it bears saying that it took PyPy very many attempts at the JIT to uh, um, actually arrive at one that was performant enough for Python. And for us in particular, we wanted to have a JIT that will have no interpreter overhead, uh, traces that are statically compiled. Um, we wanted to move data from uh, frames to registers so that they could be available for the processor right away. 
way, we needed to inline hot code paths so that this would be very fast and had broad platform support. So these days, we don't really have that many anymore computing platforms, but we still have more than one. So you have Intel processors, you have ARM processors, you still have PowerPC used in big servers, uh, and you have even S390X IBM processors that we are still supporting, and so on and so on. So all of this we wanted to have without additional complexity, which uh, caused this to be very hard to implement, but now Brand Booker is spearheading an effort to actually make this work in a sort of way that mm, reminds me of Mad Libs. So you have compiled templates of code, and then you only fill them out with actual data, and you can make a series of them, so like a series of sentences here, where every opcode is now machine operations, right? So this is kind of the design of the JIT for Python these days. And obviously, this is only possible through massive investment on the part of big corporations. Um, and that investment is either through uh, people at corporations, like the faster Python team working at Microsoft and at Bloomberg, uh, for the people working on the Python runtime at Meta, and so on and so on. So uh, those corporations are sponsoring Python uh, directly and indirectly very heavily these days. And in particular, I would like to thank Meta for sponsoring my work and allowing me to create all the images that you saw in the presentation before, uh, but also for essentially sponsoring three years of development on removal of the global interpreter lock, uh, which only allowed this change to be even considered by the steering council. Right, so I'm at time, so I don't really have, uh, you know, kind of more detail for you, but if you are interested in knowing more about how those things actually interact and how they are built, I am now running a podcast with Pablo Galindo, who is another um, release manager of Python. And in that podcast, we have like over an hour long episodes about all the details of the things that I only mentioned in this short 35 minute session today. So thanks a lot for having me. I'm here today and tomorrow. So if you have any questions about this, feel free to ask. Thanks. <laughs>